and welcome to the JFK and LBJ, the New Frontier in the Great Society special webisode series. During this webisode series, we will be comparing JFK and LBJ and examining them from a human perspective. Today, we will focus on their childhood. Today, we have Park Ranger Jonathan Straff from the John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site and Park Ranger Joseph Owen from the Lyndon Baines Johnson National Historical Park. I am Joy Kennard, and I'm the superintendent of the Central Alabama Civil Rights Sites, which encompasses the Tuskegee Institute National Historic Site, the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site, and the Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail. Hey, Jonathan. Hello, how are you? Good, and you? I'm well, nice to see you today. Good to see you as well. Hey, Joseph. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you, and you? Doing good, doing good. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's jump right into our discussion about childhood because our audience really wants to know. The first question is how did their parents recall the childhoods of these future presidents? What did the men themselves recall about their childhoods? Well, as folks can probably see directly behind me is the birthplace of the 35th president of the United States. So uh, okay. this, this was the first home um, that uh, Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald and Joseph Patrick Kennedy uh, are going to live in. They're gonna get married in October of 1914 and move in here. Um, Joseph Patrick Kennedy is coming from East Boston. Um, he is the uh, son of a politician and a business owner. On the other side, Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald is coming from uh, the north end of Boston and also Dorchester. Her father was the first Irish American Catholic mayor of the city of Boston um, and also was a member of the House of Representatives and also uh, the state Senate here uh, in Massachusetts. So they moved to the the, uh, the house behind me, quiet neighborhood in, in Brookline. And every summer uh, they would go to the seashore. And so in uh, the summer of 1915, Joe Jr., is the firstborn. So he's not born in the house behind me. He's born um, in Nantasket. But Jack Kennedy, that, that's what his friends and family called him when he was younger was Jack. So you hear me say Jack a lot, uh, but it's the same as John F. Kennedy. So he's going to be born May 29th, 1917, um, in the parents' master bedroom in the house uh, right behind me. And so what the parents remember, and Jack also remembers as well, is that this young man is ill on a regular basis. If you can name a uh, childhood illness from the early 20th century, uh, this little guy is going to have it. Uh, he nearly died um, at the age of about three and a half from scarlet fever. Um, he had to go to Boston City Hospital, and the only way he was able to get to Boston City Hospital is his father, or excuse me, his, uh, his grandfather uh, was former mayor of the city of Boston since Brookline was its own uh, community. Um, but he had to convalesce. But he had bronchitis, he had measles, he had mumps. Um, uh, later on in life, he's gonna be diagnosed with Addison's disease, but he misses a lot of school. And as a result of that, he spends a lot of time alone. He spends a lot of time thinking about things. Um, he loves being read stories when he's quite small. And by the time he's able to read, we're probably talking about seven or eight years of age, he loves reading adventure stories. He loves reading and hearing about uh, history. And so his parents, and he'll remember being sick as well. And I think, and we'll talk more about this, that um, his memories of childhood are going to kind of go between probably an elements of pain in terms of being ill, but simultaneously his mother, uh, Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald very much believed um, in pushing the children to be uh, intellectual. So she will push them, as we talked about, to read. She'll also uh, make them very much aware of current events, things that are going on in the world. She wants them to have discussions. Uh, Joseph Kennedy um, is absent um, more so because of work, but as Jack uh, gets sick a lot, and I would argue that around 1920 when Jack gets really sick is when Joe begins to come back to the family and begins to kind of work very, very hard. So um, in terms of the childhoods, uh, he 
had both positive and negative memories. Um, uh, in the first episode, we talked about him making a trip to Ireland. Um, what's interesting is when he comes back from Ireland, he writes a letter to the elderly woman who owned the house behind me, sort of talking about the place of his birth. So even though he leaves this house uh, when he's about three and a half and then moves to a home in Brookline and then leaves Brookline uh, and goes to, uh, to New York and then, of course, um, uh, travels pretty much around the world, um, this place, this Brookline, very much sort of shapes uh, who he is, his memories, and also his parents' memories of his early childhood. Joseph? Yes, uh, LBJ was born at what is today the LBJ Ranch. He was born on August 27, 1908, in a dog trot cabin, which is a, a, a Texas cabin that is two little cabins connected by a common roof. Um, mm. He was born, actually, uh, when his father was doing good in the cotton industry. Uh, Sam Jr. was a, a farmer. He was a man of many talents, but when LBJ was born, he was a cotton farmer. Unfortunately, wow. in 1913, the cotton industry went bust. It, too much cotton flooded the market. He mm -hmm. had to sell everything he had at the ranch and move to Johnson City, LBJ's boyhood home. Mm -hmm. That was a source of embarrassment for... Uh, his wife, um, Sam's wife, Rebecca Baines Johnson. Rebecca was uh, the daughter of Joseph Baines. She was a uh, educated woman. She was born up in North Texas, in McKinney, Texas, in, in 1881. Uh, Sam is born. Sam Jr. is born in a town called Buda in 1877. And when they moved out to the LBJ Ranch, uh, they had the aspiring hopes of being a successful farmer. Um, and when Sam Jr. had to sell the, the birthplace to the president, it was a source of embarrassment that Rebecca would always remind her husband of for the rest of his life. It was a source of not shame, but it was a, a, a source of disappointment. Um, but at the same time, though, Sam Johnson was a, was a powerful man, though, because when they moved to Johnson City, when LBJ was five, they moved to the boyhood home, what we call the boyhood home today. And it was actually built in 1901 by the Blanco County Sheriff. And it was one of the, they took all the money they had to sell. I mean, they sold the farm, but they took all the money and bought one of the most fanciest town, uh, fanciest homes in Johnson City. It was a very nice home. It's a very spacious home. And it was, uh, it was where Lyndon Johnson spent some of his best memories, he said, but also some tough memories because um, of Sam being able to lose the family money. Rebecca, the mother, was a very high, sophisticated woman. Though she did not get a degree, she was pursuing a degree in journalism when she met Sam Jr. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a newspaper reporter, and she was able to write columns for the Johnson City newspaper. But then she switched careers. She became a teacher. That's before, you know, you had to have a teaching license and all that. They just interviewed her and said, this woman's qualified. So she taught reading, writing, public speaking, and coached the high school debate team. But she always made sure that her children got a quality education. One thing which is kind of funny is Rebecca considered herself an educator more than she considered herself a quote unquote housewife. Um, she said, my job is not to clean the home. My job is to educate my children. And okay, so unfortunately, when, uh, when people came over, they'd find the house a little unkept and they would feel bad for the family. So relatives and visitors would have to clean the home. But she stood her ground, she goes, my job is not to be a housewife. My job is to educate my children. And that is a love of education that was instilled in LBJ. But Rebecca was also a tutor. She would teach from her home after school. If your child had a struggle in a subject um, at school, you went to go see Rebecca, or they called her Miss Rebecca. So it was a love of it was a love of education on one half that he learned in the boyhood home, but also a love of politics. Sam Jr., even though he lost the farm, he ran for politics and he became a very powerful Texas state senator. LBJ said that some of the best memories he's ever had was going on the campaign trail with his father throughout central Texas um, and having people come over. Sam would invite his fellow senator friends and they would have a lively discussion and LBJ used to crawl underneath the home 
and listen to his father and their friends have uh, private discussions about politics. And I don't know what they were actually talking about. Nobody really does. LBJ doesn't get into that. I'd love to know. <laughs> but he used to actually put his ear up on the uh, floor of a house and listen in. He, the love of politics was instilled in his from his father, Sam Jr. Um, and LBJ made it a point to uh, get a good quality education. And that was because of Rebecca Baines Johnson. One thing that made LBJ very conscious about was his education. That's one of the reasons why he passed this Elementary and Secondary Education Act, because he felt even though he got a degree in education from Southwest Texas Teachers College, which is today the Texas State in San Marcos, he felt that the degree he had was not equal to a degree that other colleges would have back east. He was very, very conscientious about that. And he wanted to make sure everybody got a quality education. And that was the cornerstone of the great society that LBJ pushed and got legislation patched, was to have a high quality education. Every American have an opportunity to get an education if they wanted to. And it was because of the love of education from his mother, the love of politics from his father, Sam. Now, LBJ never went to state politics. He went federal right away. I think it's because... Um, he saw his father struggle later on. Sam Jr., when times were tough, his political enemies delighted in reminding Sam Jr. that he was a failure. And mm. that was also very, very tough for LBJ to listen to. And mm. also for LBJ's mother, Rebecca, to listen to. Uh, her complaining about her husband. And that really did mold LBJ to be very self-conscious about the way he was raised. I think a lot of that also is reflected in the great society to have everybody not get a handout, but a hand up. That's why LBJ would say, I'm not here to give a handout. I'm here to give a hand up. And that was what LBJ really believed in with the great society. And a lot of that began in the boyhood home where LBJ was raised. I'm beginning to like these uh, families more and more. You know, I just love that Rebecca. Um, she would definitely love to ski university and uh, the origins of it, um, how Booker T. Washington came here being an educator, being a teacher, loving to um, uh, uh, share knowledge. Um, his wives did as well. Uh, the piece about farming was just incredible to hear too, especially with the connections with George Washington Carver and crop rotation that he started. And I mean, all the traveling that uh, JFK did as a young man um, reminds me of all the traveling uh, Booker T. Washington did raising money for his school, which is just phenomenal. I just really like these families. Okay, the next question we have is how did the relationship between parents and siblings shape the characters of both men. Yeah, I want to make a couple more connections. And I think one of the things that struck me, uh, Joe and Joy, in, in reading about LBJ is there are some significant similarities between Rebecca and Rose Kennedy. Um, hmm. And uh, I, one thing that sort of struck me, Joe, was, is Rebecca's sense of isolation uh, when she moves to uh, the Hill Country. And Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald Kennedy experienced some of that when she came to Brookline. Now, obviously, the Hill Country is very different than a suburb of Boston, but for someone who had been the center of Boston social life as the mayor's daughter, to move four miles out uh, to the suburbs uh, for her was, was a struggle. Uh, and then very quickly to become a mother uh, as well. And so um, there's some interesting connections there, but also as you were kind of getting at Joe and Joy as well, um, these two strong female characters who are pushing all of their children to have an intellectual life uh, and to recognize the importance of um, where they are uh, in the world. And I think uh, uh, Rose Kennedy would oftentimes quote the Gospel of St. Luke to, to whom much is given, much is expected. And you certainly see that with the, uh, the Fitzgerald, Kennedy and Fitzgerald family. And I would argue you see that uh, with the Johnson family as well. Um, it's, it's what you can do. And, and Joe, I think you put it quite well in terms of, of LBJ talking about not a handout, but a hand up. Ask mm -hmm. not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do uh, for uh, your country. So um, the relationship, again, with the, with the Kennedy family, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, you have nine siblings. 
Um, and you've got quite an age span between Joe Jr. and then Gene. Um, and uh, as a result of that, you've got Joe Jr., who's the oldest, and he oftentimes, if you if you sort of look at the traditional Kennedy narrative, he was the one who was supposed to become president of the United States. He could do no wrong. Um, he was the golden child, did a great job in school, was a great athlete. Jack, of course, is always ill. Jack always looks like an unmade bed. He comes to dinner late. Um, <laughs> he is never never quite ready for 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 prime time. And um, mm -hmm. He will have, and we have Rosemary, who was uh, born with intellectual disabilities. So um, the family kind of rallied around her and attempted to help her in some way, shape, or form. But some folks would argue that um, the, the level of empathy that the Kennedys have for uh, folks who are uh, born with circumstances not of their own making uh, is going to be coming from that uh, experience. But this close-knit family and um, Joe Jr. is always working, always pushing his kids. He has a famous quote where he said, excuse me, Joe Sr., uh, the father, Joe Sr., who could be kind of a harsh guy sometimes. Uh, he said at one point, uh, we don't want any losers around here. We want only winners. So pushing his kids uh, forward. Simultaneously, Rose is, uh, and as Jack Kennedy once says, uh, she's uh, the glue that held the family together. Now, she wasn't a, a big fan of being called glue uh, for a variety of reasons, but the fact of the matter is um, both of these parents have different skill sets uh, that they will uh, pass on to future generations. But I think um, the kids themselves, uh, Joy, you talked about traveling, uh, they will experience, but at the same time, we'll talk more about this later on, um, they do spend a lot of time with friends and family. And so while they have this kind of sense of other things that are going on in the world, I would argue that they're not going to be aware of George Washington Carver. They're not going to be aware of the Tuskegee Institute. Um, Jack Kennedy is going to serve uh, in the Second World War. We'll talk more about that. But uh, I think there are certain um, blind spots that he is going to have um, that, to his credit, he's able to overcome over time. So I think between his parents and his siblings, um, he's able to develop this confidence, um, this intellectual life, um, this ability to have a strong um, pain threshold with all the illness that he has to deal with that is going to sort of push him uh, forward as he's, as he's going on in life. Thank you for sharing that. Joseph? Well, um, Jonathan just remind me of something that um, I like to uh, compare. Um, Rebecca Baines Johnson, I compare her to the old 1960s television series, Green Acres. She was Ava Gabor. She was a big city girl. And moving out to the country life was a big shock for her that she never really got used to. Um, I don't know why she married Sam Jr. I have maybe a reason, maybe one of the reasons is, is because yes, they were in love, but I think she wanted to experience something different in life. Um, uh, her father, Joseph, was a very prominent man. And they, they were, she was used to the finer things, even when things were tough on the family. She was always used to having the finer things. And when she married Sam Ely Johnson Jr., it was a big shock moving out there in the Texas Hill Country away from everything mm -hmm. and having a hard life. And that yeah. was not an easy thing for her to adapt to. But she always had, quote unquote, heirs. She always felt like she was a proper lady and that she had standards of decorum. And um, when, Sam, when Sam Jr. died in 1937, as soon as he died, Rebecca moved with her kids to Austin, the capital. She got out of the, she got out of the small town. However, when she was living in the small town, she was very well respected as an educator. She really was. If your child needed extra instruction after school, you went to go see Miss Rebecca. She taught public speaking how to eloquate yourself, how to speak properly and pronounce effectively. And Sam Jr., one of his occupations was being a teacher. He was a, he dabbled in law. He was a farmer. He was a Texas state politician, which is the most important job I believe he had was becoming a state senator. And Lyndon Johnson used to go with Sam up to the up to the state capitol. And so when Lyndon Johnson was 13, he started right next to his father in the Texas legislature and listened to the process of state government. And that really was a learning experience for Lyndon Johnson. And one quick thing I want to say, the night that Lyndon Johnson was born, Sammy Lee Johnson Sr., the president's grandfather, took that baby, went up to people and said, this baby's gonna be a future president of the United States. 
<laughs> and what a what a what a forecast that was. Um, and so a love of education and LBJ. Now, one thing about this is that Sam and Rebecca made no bones about that. They said Lyndon is the, her, their favorite child out of out of all the siblings. He had Rebecca sister, Josepha sister, Lucia sister, and young brother Sam Houston Johnson. Uh, and they made no bones about it, though. All their attention went to Lyndon Johnson. And so he always felt both parents love. And I asked Lucy Johnson, the president's youngest daughter, uh, about a year ago, I said, ma'am, if you could give me the experience of your father's home life, living in Johnson City, what would you say? And she said, humble and loving, which, wow. which I really thought was uh, what well, was neat to hear because, uh, you know, it was a very close family as well. And they used to have, uh, with education, they used to have impromptu spelling beads around the kitchen table after dinner. They used to have math quizzes. They used to have debating contests. They listen to a radio or they get a newspaper. Sam Jr. would get a newspaper. He would say, Lyndon, I want you and your sister Rebecca to read this article. You take the pros of the article. She'll take the cons of the article and you all debate because they believed if you were debating, you were thinking. And mm -hmm. that always helped Lyndon Johnson throughout his Senate and presidential career. Learning that at the boyhood home, learning that with his siblings. And so the boyhood home, the relationship LBJ always was proud to bring people to his boyhood home in Johnson City when he was president. We have photographs of him with various politicians and world leaders sitting right there at the porch swing on the front porch. And it was the front porch of the boyhood home, which was the launching point of the path that led him to the White House in Johnson City. Wow, that is fascinating. Thank you so much, Joseph. I have the last question here. Who and or what were the most important forces in shaping the early lives of these young men? Yeah, and I think Joe's did a fantastic job of, of talking about how both parents mm -hmm. are very much going to shape uh, LBJ. Um, uh, and, and I think we sort of, I sort of dealt with this a little bit earlier on too, in terms of how Joe, uh, Joe Kennedy and, and Rose uh, Kennedy are going to kind of shape um, JFK. A um, couple things, I, uh, connections I wanted to make. Well, first of all, I, I do have to say this, I haven't said this yet, but I do share a birthday with, uh, with LBJ. I was also born on August 27th. And then I was also born the year that he passed away. So, you know, I don't know whether I was destined to do this program or not, but there you I have it. <laughs> so there's that. So. But um, the other thing too, and, uh, and Joe hinted at this a, a little while ago, I think um, we were sort of hinting, and the question sort of ties into this too, in terms of uh, the influences. Um, uh, LBJ's dad, of course, Sam, um, had was a great listener, right? He could read people extraordinarily well, but he originated the Johnson treatment, which of course Johnson will go on to use as both a, a member of the House of Representatives uh, and the U.S. Senate, and of course, arguably, most importantly, as, as President of the United States. Um, I think what's interesting on the flip side of that is that Jack Kennedy sort of embodies elements of both of his parents in the sense that um, where LBJ is a very forceful kind of take charge guy, Jack Kennedy more often than not would be sort of in the back of the room listening and reading people, um, but not necessarily taking action, but taking it all in and then thinking about it and then writing it down. Um, and I think you'll see, we'll talk more about education uh, in the next episode, but I think mm -hmm. Kennedy's intellectual life and Kennedy's um, uh, ability to kind of read a room, understand people and listen and be fascinated is gonna be coming from his mother. And to a certain extent, his father. His father is a business person, but also later um, uh, a public servant, first as uh, chairman of the, of the Securities Exchange Commission and then Maritime, and then of course, ambassador uh, to Great Britain, which uh, Joe Kennedy didn't do quite well as an ambassador. I think his, his son did a better job as being a statesman um, uh, than, than he did. Uh, but you, I think, see on some level him taking uh, elements of, of both sets of parents and sort of going in different directions where, um, as Joe was talking about, I think it's much more clear with LBJ uh, in terms of uh, the education piece, which again, we'll talk more about in detail later on, but also 
the complicated relationship too, uh, this is one of the pieces I wanted to say, um, between JFK and his mom and also his father as well. And I think you see elements of that with LBJ and his mom, Rebecca, as well. Rebecca, again, had high standards for behavior and had high standards for performance. Rose Kennedy was exactly the same. Rose Kennedy, um, after the birth of each child, oftentimes would go on a vacation. Uh, and justifiably so. She's at home with the children. She does have servants, which is a <laughs> which is a different environment, of course, than Rebecca's dealing with. But um, one of the things that Jack Kennedy says to her when he's about five years of age is, fine mother you are, always going and leaving your children. And Rose sort of takes that as a joke, but that clearly is going to have an impact on him. So their relationship is complicated. Um, throughout the course of his political career, uh, she will continue to correct him. Uh, she'll write him letters. Uh, she will, uh, as Joe was talking about, um, have high expectations. Uh, and uh, there's a great story, a very quick story, where um, in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, Rose Kennedy was actually writing to Nikita Khrushchev, who was the, uh, uh, the, the chairperson of the Soviet Union. And she, she would collect autographs from famous people. And, and President Kennedy has to contact his mom and say, you know, mom, you might want to wait until after this international crisis uh, is over uh, before uh, you, you, you seek out the autographs. But um, he also sought out the advice of his father. And what's sort of interesting is that um, in December of 1961, I think I'm getting the, the, the month right. But so again, Jack Kennedy's inaugurated as president in January of 61. Um, his father, Joe Kennedy, suffers a stroke. And as a result of that, he cannot really speak or communicate with Jack any longer. So it's an interesting moment in time where you have this, this strong father figure who someone who we admired and spoke to on a, uh, a fairly normal basis, that voice disappears. So Jack has to look to other voices. Some of those folks will be in his cabinet, um, but that's really, I would argue, when his relationship with Bobby uh, becomes that much more uh, significant. And we'll talk more about their relationship in terms of shaping civil rights um, uh, policies later on. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Joseph? Well, I think the two major themes that LBJ had throughout his life was because of his parents. Number one was his father, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, in 2009, I just saw a YouTube video. In 2009, Robert Caro, who was the definitive biographer of Lyndon Johnson, he was speaking to the University of Southern California Public Affairs. And one of the audience asked him after he gave the lecture about LBJ, why do you think LBJ was so hesitant about Vietnam? Um, there's a lot of interesting you know, things and facts about that. But Robert Caro said something. He said, it's because his father, Sam, lost the farm. That was the biggest influence on Lyndon Johnson that was not really talked about. Lyndon Johnson was afraid to be a failure because his father, Sam, lost the farm. He said it was the one major thing in life that really influenced Lyndon Johnson is what Robert Carroll said, was the, fail, was the fear of failing like his father. And that also carried throughout LBJ's life. He wanted to overcome that. He wanted to let people know, I am not a failure like my dad. He would never say that publicly. No, he would never say that. However, that's how he would react with things, not being a failure. Um, with his mother, Rebecca, it was education instilled at a young age. I mean, she would be drilling education into Lyndon Johnson. She knew, she said that education is a key to success. And Sam mm -hmm. Jr. said the same thing. And so it was both parents were such, I think Lyndon Johnson tried to overcome his father's failure of losing the ranch there in Stonewall, and which is today the LBJ Ranch. He bought his father's land back. He made sure that he bought his father's land. And when he bought the Texas White House from his aunt Frank Martin, his father's sister in 1950, it came with 250 acres. And over the years, Lyndon Johnson would buy back the house, he would buy back the land that his father had to sell. And he bought more land. He wanted to have people see, see, I can get as much land as I wanted. My father may have lost the farm, but I'm going to get it back. And that was the way Lyndon Johnson was. And it's the way that was shaping his, with his policies as well. And like, uh, you know, we'll talk about that further in the series, but it was Sam Jr. politics and failing 
the family farm and Rebecca with education that really shaped Lyndon Johnson. And also one quick thing, when LBJ would go throughout central Texas with his father on the campaign trail, there is no doubt LBJ saw poverty and discrimination in, in, in these small towns in Texas. That really, really, really influenced Lyndon Johnson. He saw it because in central Texas, Joy, back in the early 1900s from Reconstruction all the way up probably until the 1940s and 50s, if you were a minority, you left by sundown. Mm -hmm. You did not stay overnight in town. And if you had to do any business as a minority, you went behind the business. You didn't go through the front door. And Lyndon Johnson saw all that. And that would also be a big influence later on with the Civil Rights Act, with the Great Society Act, is seeing that with his father. And I know Sam and Lyndon would talk exclusively about what they saw, what a problem was with society in, in the South. Texas is part of the South. And seeing the small towns do that really influenced Lyndon Johnson later on and the discussions he would have with his father, Sam Jr., about why, what they saw. Wow. You know, I think the right word to sum up these men is young people, children, is perseverance. They really had an, a huge amount, a huge dose, and so did their family, especially that Rebecca, I love her, of perseverance. Well, we are out of time. We thank you for joining us for this episode on childhood and the next episode is on education. Please join us there. Thank you very much.